Thanks for joining us on One on One. I'm Andrew Maher. Neil Barr personified the raw aggression harnessed and used with such intimidation by the mighty Richmond sides of the early 70s. A wild and shaggy haired ruckman forward, Barr will be forever remembered for poleaxing the entire Carlton backline in the 1973 grand final. But it has been as coach of Melbourne in a seesawing four year career that we have seen the other side of this most intriguing character. Neil Barb was a tough and ruthless ruckman in his years at Richmond. A veteran of 159 games, Barb also proved a handy forward at Tigerland, amassing 229 goals. While he often showed aggression, one of his best attributes was his strong marking, but he is also remembered for turning the game after this altercation with Carlton's Jeff Southby and Vin Waite in the 1973 Grand Final. He played in Richmond's 73 and 74 Premiership sides and later became a highly successful coach with Norwood in South Australia. Lured to Melbourne in 1993, he is yet to taste the successes he enjoyed in South Australia. It's been a tough baptism for the Demon leader as form and injuries continue to take their toll at Melbourne and it's often a dejected face we see from the coach who still searches for the rewards he was so used to elsewhere. Neil, thanks for joining us on uh, 101. Thanks, Andrew. What was it about Carlton back in those days? I think we had somebody, I was talking to somebody else from Richmond of, of that era not so long ago, and it just seemed to be something that raised the ire of Richmond people back in the 70s. Oh, I think Carlton were very good. Yeah. <laughs> that was the problem, I think. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of riv rivalry in those days. I mean, I think we're both pretty good sides. Was there anything personal? Like, was there you know, any personal duels and, and oh, feuds no, that no. used to be fought out out there? Or? No, I don't think so. Yeah, no. yeah. yeah. Not, not from my point of view, well, anyway. What happened in 73? I mean, it's one of those classic bits of, of um, grand final footage that people talk about a lot, and you were grimacing a little bit when we were playing it then. What, what was it, what happened in 73? What was it that sort of sparked that? Uh... Oh, oh, that was, um, footy was different in those days. I think um, 1972, Carlton played that magnificent grand final against us, and I think we kicked the previous, uh, equaled the previous record high score in mm -hmm. a grand final, and got beaten by you know, five or six goals. Um, so I think all that, all that, pre-season we were sort of trying to uh, you know, figure out a way that we're going to get back at them and, and win the next next year and uh, I think that had a fair bit of impact. Did they, they wore the sort of mantle as being a little bit suspect under sort of physical pressure and they sort of carried that with them even though a lot yeah. of people dispute that it's a reality but was that something that you suspected and Tommy suspected might have actually been a weakness? Oh, I, I think we were just hoping that and I think, um, I mean we, we believe that we were a tough side in those days whether we were or whether we weren't. It, you know, that's the way we were pushed up to play and yeah. it was a lot different in those days. Yeah. Well you were a pretty tough side weren't you? Oh, I think we were, yeah, and I think, um, and I think Carlton were a pretty strong tough side too, but it, uh, we were probably just that bit nastier I think. Yeah. Did you and Ricky McLean, I think some, somebody else was telling me that you and Ricky McLean had a bit of a pact between the two of you, they did, whenever you played Carlton you'd look for the number 30, a bloke called oh, Vin White no. in the back <laughs> <laughs> You better ask Ricky about that. <laughs> but, yeah, but uh, that, wh where did it come from, that, that whole sort of personality that that, that sort of was created about that Richmond side in the seventies. Tommy was obviously a, a pretty hard. Yeah, well, the Tommy actually he never. There was never at any stage that Tommy ever advocated violence, mm. if you like. Mm. And he was always. He believed and still believes that the tough players were the ones who stand their ground under the footy, and the tough ones were the ones who, you know, who uh, weren't tough when they were in the box seat, but mm. when you know, when they had to stand up. And and he always reckoned it was a weak bloke who threw the elbow, etc. So it certainly wasn't anything in the way Tommy taught us. But he was he was a winner. Um, he was uncompromising in that, which I think brought the rest of us it out of us. And um, I think we sort of tried to. The image of Richmond was presented as really tough and ruthless, and uh, not prepared to take any prisoners. And I think Graham Richmond had a fair bit to do with that. I was going to say, I mean, the on and off the field stuff went hand in glove, didn't it, back in yeah. those days? Because not only was it a tough club on the ground and played their footy in straight lines and all that sort of stuff, but they didn't mess around off the field either, did they? Yeah, I, that, you know, that was a great strength, but in the end maybe it was a bit of a weakness because I think um, you know, footy changed a bit and we seemed to be making ruthless decisions for the sake of making them in a sense, mm. you know, with some of the blokes that left and, you know, the... Um, 
I guess when we recruited uh, John Petura, they saw he was the answer to all of our problems, and to do that, we had to sacrifice, you know, some of the the real good guys, mm. the Brian Robertses and, and those, and even mm. Graham Teasdale. So I suppose they had to win in that from that point of view, and maybe that cost us a little bit on the field. Yeah. But um, no, it, was, it was a great era, and it was it really was. I think Graham wanted us to be seen as a really tough, hard side, and and, and it was really. A, you know, wonderful place to be involved with a terrific mateship amongst yeah. the blokes. It's probably an easy recollection for us to um, to think of think back to '73 and think of that as being the sort of encapsulating, defining moment of your playing career. And yet, you played you know 160, 170 games. Um, are, are you happy wearing that as you know part of your sort of CV? Oh, well, I mean, you can't you can't change what's happened. You can't yeah. deny um, fact. Um, but. Because that was a grand final, that's the last game, and you've got six months for everyone to talk about what happened that game. I think it becomes probably a little bit bigger than it was. Yeah. Now, you know, in some ways, um, you know, particularly in nowadays, and footy was such a clean game. I mean, last night Peter Dean got uh, four weeks for kicking, and I, I looked at that and I think I, I can't believe that that bloke has now got to wear the fact that he four weeks for kicking someone, and I don't reckon he actually. I mean, he certainly didn't mm. kick him in the in the real true sense of the word kick. So I think times have changed enormously. But um, from my own point of view, I, I mean, I get sometimes, you know, because of the, the, the position I'm in now, I'm a bit embarrassed about it in a sense. Mm. But I mean, footy's footy, and it was that's what we did then, and we won, and it was all that was important. During the games lost, uh, look, trial by video. There have been a, there have been elements of all the changes that we've had to the game that have been really, really good and positive for footy. I don't think anybody's going to sort of argue about that. But do you think we have gone too far now? I mean, that Peter Dean incident. Look like one of those grandstanding affairs for the tribunal where we've got to we've got to be seen to be making a point without taking into account the actual incident and the effect that it has on a professional sportsman. Yeah, well, that, what I, I if I were involved in the tribunal and there'd be a lot of people would say perish the thought. I guess <laughs> <laughs> now, I think there's got to be some genuine malicious intent before you can be rubbed out for doing something. I mean, if if there is some sort of contact like there was with uh, Peters, but it, to me there was no no malice about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't call that a four-week thing, mm -hmm. in my in my opinion. I think you've actually, somebody's actually got to go out and say, I'm going to belt that bloke, or I'm going to kick that bloke, or I'm going to elbow that bloke, and then you should deal with it. But you can't, oh, well, that happened, therefore you had, should, should have been more careful the way you played. It doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense to me. And, and I think because nothing happens now, we find blokes for wrestling, or we find blokes for being in a melee. I mean, mm -hmm. And I, I still, apart from maybe the tribunal and maybe some people on the commission, I can't find anybody who cares about the melee yeah. or the wrestling. Yeah. And, and maybe they've got a, maybe they're smarter than me. Maybe there's a bigger picture that I can't see. But it just to find a bloke, I mean, one of our blokes got fined two thousand dollars for wrestling. I mean, all he was, he just happened to be there. Mm. And two grand. I mean, I don't know whether two grand is important to say new or busy, but it certainly is for this young yeah. bloke. It's an yeah. enormous amount yeah. of money for those guys. Yeah. Well, you've been involved in, back involved in AFL footy now, and we've, we have seen this redirection of, of where the tribunal's coming from and the way they're imposing their fines and, and the way reports are being laid on video and all the rest of it. Have you developed a bit of a theory as to why it's happening? And no, I, I only look at it from a practical point of view, what we do with our players. And, and I can see that in a lot of ways it's good for the players because it makes them more disciplined, it makes them less likely to do those things and it gets on with the game and it makes a better spectacle. And in a lot of ways it's much easier to coach because mm. kid blokes are more disciplined in what they do. So I can, I think that's their direction. I mean, every time you pick up, you pick up, hear the apocryphal story of the mums who won't let their kids mm. play footy and mm. make them play basketball because they won't get hurt and they won't get dirty. So I blame the mums. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I reckon we're trying to please the mums well, over the game. What does Mrs Barnes say about that? Oh, agree, well, yeah. My wife and my mother don't worry too yeah. much about it, but it's someone else's mum I think we're worrying about because they want, they want it to be a nice, clean, safe game for their boys. And, and I can understand that, but in the end, when you, when you play footy, mm. I mean, there's always a chance of getting dirty and but maybe a chance of getting hurt. As a parent yourself, I mean, do you have those concerns that the game is becoming, before they started cleaning up, did you, would you have stopped your children from playing footy if they wanted to play? Oh, no, well, no, I, I wouldn't. I mean, if, if I said I would, I'd be sacked, I yeah, suppose. Yeah. But I don't, I don't think there's any problem with it. I mean. Yeah. Particularly if you, I guess it's a matter of degree, I, I can remember back to when footy was played in the early 60s when it was, you know, comparatively quite brutal, mm. but it's changed enormously since then and there's really virtually no danger in terms of that sort of violence. I mean, mm. there's a fair bit of danger because they run pretty hard and run pretty fast at each other, but that's, I mean, you've got to take a punt at some mm. stage. Mm. We've got more to talk about. We'll come back after this break on One on One with Neil Barn. You're 
on uh, 101, we're talking to Neil Barm, and there you are, Barmy, one of your quarter time or three quarter time addresses. Do you sort of like looking at yourself in this mode as a, in the middle of your coaching <laughs> notes? <particular. laughs> you've, uh, you, that's, you've probably, it's become your, almost superseded the 1973 footage now, some of those classic moments we've seen of you in the coach's box during games. Yeah, it's all the bad moments they keep, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of us will say they're great moments. I mean, what what happens in the box at that time when, when the frustration levels get to a point where you are forced to rock back and run the fingers through the hair and put the face in the hands? What's Griffo, what's Griffo and Pete Russell and those players, what are they saying to you at times like that? Uh, they keep me out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got to deal with with the bones, with Barry Richardson, and he's once I settle down, he, he's got to settle me down and get me back on track. But uh, oh, it's it's been pretty emotional. It was, I mean, particularly when we do things that are so um, so I guess so silly, so petty. I mean, mm. it would drop drop the ball, can't pick it up. All those things that I mean, you worry about if you're coaching junior footy. Mm. Um, you know, we tend to lose it a bit and do that, and that becomes very difficult because, I mean, from a coach's point of view, there's not much you can do about it. You just see it happen, you go, well, well, I know he's not trying to do it, mm. but it's happening. Well, it, it's funny that you mention that because there's been, from some quarters, criticism of the way you, you, we've perceived Neil Barm to try and have Melbourne play. I mean, this, we hear of game plans and all the rest of it, and it's just a breakdown of skill level, and the fact that you've got so many quality players not out there it doesn't help. But because those things happen, people turn around and say, he's got to start doing something different. He's coaching the side incorrectly. He's got to get rid of the game plan and make it more simple. Have you, you've always been, you've always managed to keep all, any response to those sorts of criticisms pretty all sort of under double wraps. How do you feel about it? Oh, look, you, I mean, people uh, have the right to criticise as much as they like, but um, I think our, our game is very simple. Um, but if you're playing AFL footy and you can't catch, you can't kick, you can't end ball, well, I think we've got an enormous problem. You can't make it any simpler. The only way to make it simpler than that is not get it at all. Mm. Um, and, but is, but is, it, is it that simple? Is it? Is there any is there anything you're trying to do down there and have tried to do since you came to Melbourne? Is there something that, that is a little bit sophisticated in, in what you're trying to do? Oh, no, I think we're still very basic about what, what we're trying to do. What, what I, I guess, deep down want blokes to do is understand percentages in the game and mm. understand what they should do and what can happen and what therefore what they should do uh, but there's nothing too tricky about mm. it I mean there's no you go here then he goes there then you go there then he goes there and then we get it mm. over there mm. so sort of, it, it's all pretty much reactive to what to where the ball is and then our blokes have got to be in the right place to be offensive or right place to chase him, I guess. You played so a it's lot pretty simple. Yeah. yeah well you played a lot of footy under Tommy Hafey and I, I guess when it comes to simple game philosophies, match day philosophies, Tommy's almost in a class of his own. I think that John Northey is probably one of his disciples that continues to practice what Tommy preached. Um, are you a different coach than the one that you were coached by? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, that was a hell of a long time ago. Mm. I mean, footy has um, developed a bit. The sort of players have got to have changed a lot. We're not, they're not just um, they're not as accepting as perhaps they were in those days. Mm. Um, and I think there are things in footy that you can do to make I mean, Tommy's plan was very simple but very good, but there are ways not to make it better necessarily, but you can take more advantage of situations, which is what we're trying to mm. do. Yeah. When you say accepting, players are more, were probably more accepting back in those days. What, what do you mean by that? Oh, I think when you told someone to do something, they just did it without yeah. asking, why would I do that and what's in it for me, etc. And not, not that I think the players today are difficult, but they are different. I think kids are brought up differently mm. than they used to be. How so? Can you sort of put your finger on it simply? Well, I'm not an educationalist, but I'd say that um, just the style of teaching kids. When, when we were kids, you used to be you sit there and fold your arms and don't make a noise and do what you're told. Mm. Whereas now, I think there's much more of. I mean, the kids' rights are taken into account more. They're asked their opinion, the, and what they want to do, they do rather than just do what they're told. And mm. I think, obviously, that comes through, and players need to know more about what's going on and, and the reasons for it. Otherwise, they won't be motivated to do it. Whereas mm. I think once you virtually accepted the, the power figure and he said, do this, and you did it without any question, yeah, question of, what, yeah. is that a good idea? Mm. I, I think things have changed, but for, for the better, I think. No. Have you changed a lot since, you know, since you were this bloke way back here on the old <laughs> Scanlon's footy card? I think we can get a shot of that, can't we? Have you changed much since your playing days? Have you, oh, I uh, think I look, still look pretty that. much like that. <laughs> that. There's, uh, in fact, the hair could probably be about that length again. Can it, the thing I'm struck by uh, that shot is how skinny your arms are in that in that photo. I, mean, oh, yeah, I started more gym courses than I finished, I can tell you. 
<laughs> this, the definition applies at least. Look, Barry Cable was a classic down there in the bottom right hand corner of that screen, but the definition applies. It just they are a, a different human being these days running around oh, right there, think, aren't they? Oh, we're much more professional now. We get a lot more across the board, a lot more out of ourselves. Mm -hmm. and there were some blokes who played in my time who were like the blokes are today, mm -hmm. but there would have only been a few of the really dedicated ones, if you like, the ones mm -hmm. who really went to the limit to do what they should do. There's quite a few of those, but. Now, virtually everybody has to do that, that otherwise they don't get to the line. But getting back to that point about you, the evolution of yourself from player to coach, have you gone through you know, a deep sort of f philosophical readjustment or something like that from the days you played to the way you look at the game now? Oh, I don't think so, no. I think I've always reacted to the game as it, as it is. I'm still very competitive. Um, you know, I guess your position as a coach as opposed to a player is totally different. As a player, you're very much um, introverted to what you need to do for yourself and as you become a more experienced player then you can impose yourself on the other guys mm. but as a coach you can't be thinking about yourself at all you're always thinking at the big picture and what's good for someone else mm. so there's a, I mean, there's a much much different I think. just in terms of the way that um the media walking down into the sort of lines down at the end of the game to confront the coach particularly after a loss is always a fairly nervous experience for, for journalists no matter how long particularly bad losses and you, you've always been one who's been able to come across as exhibiting and maintaining great sort of control and a calm. There's always been a real calm about you after, you know, some pretty horrific losses. Yeah, I think if you came in immediately <laughs> the game finished, you'd probably see a different picture. But but I think that's a it's a very important responsibility for for me in my position. If if I'm always seen to be out of control and losing it even in those bad situations, it, it's not given a very good line to the players. I mean the player you can't just be I mean, we lose, we're upset, you mm. can't stay upset. Mm. Like you can be upset inside and you can want to do something about it, but you've still got to treat people, I think, with the respect that you have to. I mean, it's not the Juno's fault that yeah. we got beaten by 100 points, so yeah. you can't, I don't think I can impose it on them. I think there's elements of Malcolm Blight, there's similarities between yourself and him, particularly the way they should, you sort of dealt with um, maybe loss. Uh, and I think a lot of people are critical, were probably critical to some extent of Blighty as because he was so even after a loss, maybe because he wasn't as as angry as he could have been. His players didn't get the right yeah. message. Is there oh, any look, fear of that happening? Or? No, if, I think you don't know Blighty very well if you think that. I mean, mm. he, he, he would come across as level because he knows he has to, but I mean, he is uh, he's an enormous winner. Mm. He, he would hate it. And I think if, I never played under him, but I know a few blokes he did, and he was scathing. Yeah. I mean, you left in absolutely no doubt how disappointed he was if he lost. Yeah. So, you know, I think that was probably a wrong impression. But, yeah. but I think you have, well, I believe you have to be that way. So yeah. the players would, would see that the right picture and it might be a different one than the public yeah. is to see yeah. after Certainly it. with Malcolm. Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. look, we might have a bit of a yak about Malcolm. We'll try and finish on a good note, but uh, we'll be back with more Neil, Br Neil, Neil Balm on 101 after this break. Neil Baum, the head in the hands, he doesn't even want to look. <laughs> Richard Griffiths didn't want to look at you either, <laughs> did he? <laughs> uh, they're dark days, aren't they? I mean, from 94's preliminary final when, um, look, in the end, it was probably a reasonably convincing, convincing win by West Coast, but I don't think there was, you know, a 10-goal difference between the two sides. And, and the cold, I think get, you didn't even get showers that day, did you? Know? <laughs> showers had broken down. What's, what sort of happened since I mean we, we know about the injury list and it's a an absolute shocker is it is that what it is oh no that's obviously that contributes but I think we um, so even last year we had a terribly tough draw at the start of the year and we lost six games and but we played reasonably well in all of them and that, that's where the competition's a bit tough because it's not an even draw mm. and we you know we're really up against it and it was a great credit to our blokes that we fought back and then we won what have we won mm. eight or nine or something and put ourselves in a pretty strong position and then the draw came around again where we played the better sides and we needed to win the games and and again we didn't play all that badly apart from the Adelaide game and um, and missed out on making the eight we only needed to win one of those you know, and, and admittedly it would have been a fairly mediocre performance still mm. but we would have made the eight and then who knows what would happen after that um, so last year was a pretty disappointing but we had had our moments and um, didn't couldn't quite follow through with them but this year's been, um, you know, very sad for us. We mm. just haven't looked like it. Is it, st is it still salvageable? I mean, can something still be gotten oh, out of here? Well, I, I obviously believe it can be. I think uh, we've just got to keep working at it bit by bit and try and keep the blokes' heads up and working hard at what they're doing and 
you know, if you work hard enough in the end and work smart enough, you, you'll get a result for it. But uh, having said that, we are you know, a few good players down, mm -hmm. and that, that's no excuse, but it does make it harder because then you know, we've got to work very hard on the players believing that they can win, not, not letting them have the excuse that, oh, well, we've got a few good players out, mm -hmm. therefore it's OK for us to lose. But I think it is an excuse. It seems to be one of these ones that coaches in particular don't like to cite for probably obvious reasons, I suppose. But well, it is obvious that you can't because really if you say, well, we've got a few good players out, you're really giving permission to the blokes to not win mm. and you can't be in that position. And, and the truth is that all the players who play believe they're good enough to play league footy, mm. so it's not an excuse. Mm. I mean, if, if you were picking blokes who didn't believe they were good enough, well... I mean, that's fair enough. Yeah, yeah. But they do believe they're good enough, so we've got to, we've got to give an account of ourselves. Well, you, you, one of your roles is to keep the players sort of buoyed through this sort of experience. How do you do it yourself? How do you manage to keep yourself... Personally, yeah, no, it's, yeah. It's pretty hard because I, we live or die by, by winning and losing. You know, and you get sort of... You know, it really does get to you when you lose, particularly when you play poorly. Um, because I think all coaches take it very personally and they, you know, they take it as a personal responsibility. And, and then, then you've got to come back and try and help the players get from where they are to where they've got to be. It's, mm. it's, it's not easy when, when you're in this sort of circumstance, but I guess that's what we're paid for. I mean, mm. When it's hard, that's when you've got to be able to do it. And when you're winning games every week, the driver's dog could catch you side <laughs> in a sense. Yeah. Do you find out things about yourself that previously you may not have known? Uh, no, most, most <laughs> parts of my persona are known to me now. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. In, in great adversity you don't sort of see yourself doing things differently? Do you sort of maintain the, the sort of steady I, I think course? I think it's important, unless, unless you can actually find something for the better, I think it's important you don't do things too differently because mm. what that says is what you've done before is all wrong um, and I don't believe that is the case. Are you stubborn? Are you a stubborn person, you think? Um, probably not the person to ask. Them, <laughs> I think I'd have to be pretty stubborn yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a, I mean, would you, would it take a lot for you to sort of say, okay, maybe halfway through the season you say, okay, we've got to do something different. Would it, would it take a radical, you know, alteration and shift in the way you view things to, to turn things around at sort of 180 degrees? Well, I don't think you can. I mean, I, there's, there isn't a better way mm. in a sense. I mean, there may be marginal changes to what you do. And sometimes you have to react to your circumstances to get the most out of what you got, but it's always got to be marginal. See, if you make a big change for the sake of not having enough good players or whatever mm. the reason mm. is, when you get back to where you should be, you're going to make a huge change again, and that, that must be wrong. Mm. What about the weight that a guy like David Needs has to carry and has had to carry in 1996? I think that at the end of 95, we all thought that he was you know, right up there in the, in the top flight, and he hasn't been terribly bad in 96 but he hasn't been anywhere near the 95. Yeah I, I think I think he carries an enormous responsibility and probably that's you know made it harder for him because um, he's only you know in footy terms pretty young mm. but he's got a big heart and he's a, a lot of ability he, he'll be no problems. I, I think I still think he is um, in the top flight mm. of players mm. because he's playing with us and we haven't done much his, his job has probably been um, or his position has probably been lessened a bit, yeah, so yeah. we owe him a bit to get him up there, but he's a, he's a terrific kid. Look, with Ian Schwartz in the same team, with Gary Lyon floating around, and we don't have to go, everyone's done the, the sums before we mm. know how dangerous he could be. How have you responded to David Schwartz's situation? We had him on the show not long ago, and he was philosophical about things. How have you, one-on-one, -on -one dealt with him? Um, well, I, we haven't had a lot to do with each other lately because, and I think that's the right thing to do, um, you know, he's still got a fair while before he plays again, but I've every confidence that he will play, I've every confidence that what they're going to do with him will put him in a position where he can play, and given that that can happen, um, he'll be 24 and a good 100, mm. 100 games to go. Um, you know, we've all felt for him because he, for, for us he's an important player, but from his own point of view, I mean, he's really, he's a bloke who really wants to play mm. and express himself, he's got so much to give, it's been pretty disappointing for well, him. I imagine he'd be the sort of player that you'd quite like to coach as well, given the sort of player that he is and the oh, skills so, that he's got. Because he's what he is, he's sometimes hard to coach because yeah. he's got his own ideas and, you know, he's got a lot of flair about what he does, but when he plays well, he's, I mean, he's an extraordinarily strong influence in the team, he just does things for us. Yeah. And I think Gary Lyon is the other one at Melbourne who universally respected by players throughout the throughout the league. Um, how have you, and what's the relationship that you've had with him and what have you come to sort of know of Gary Lyon since you've been at Melbourne? Well, I mean, again, it's not you know, just an, uh, an admiration society for these blokes, but yeah. you've, picked, you've picked the right blokes. I mean, Gary, Gary is an exceptional player, as we all know, but he's also an exceptional leader around the place. 
and, and we say that pretty lightly about guys sometimes mm. and because you have to because he's your captain you say but he is exceptional I mean the way he sees the game and the way he sees the players and you know the positive influence he can have on them it's terrific and mm. he also I mean for me he's terrific because he'll always if he's got something on his mind he'll come and talk mm. about it. why don't you try this have you thought of that you know, he really is a, he's a terrific influence around you're going down to churches lighting candles yet and hoping for a bit of luck for the second half of the year in 97 oh, that's what we should be doing yeah well look you deserve it um thanks for coming on today thanks, and man. um good luck for the rest of the year and particularly next year thank you and thank you for joining us on one-on-one -on -one. we'll be back next week with another grade of the game of australian football